are not dual. We don't normally have it on two screens, do we? Or do we? Uh, someone's opened this in a uh, dual screen thing. I don't know if it's going to be off putting. Let me know and I'll change it in the break. Uh, yeah, we'll see how we go. Let me know at half time if it's good or bad. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, standard drop in. Uh, notification. Everyone please. So yeah, um, remember I've got one straight after this, if you want to uh, drop in on Mondays. Um, and remember, oh there's also course rate of typos. If you find a course, if you find an answer and you think, nah, you don't agree with it, make sure you check course rate of typos. Um, I've only found one so far, a B equals minus five, when it was written as a plus five, but hopefully well, there's not many, but one so far. Everyone, please, can we get into it? Redemptions. Um, the A1 redemptions are due. Braden, please. <laughs> Okay, so the A1 redemptions are due at the end of this week. Um, I admit, in this we don't say, oh, if you miss it by a day, we won't take it Monday. We will, but uh, we don't take it too late because we want you to mainly do it before the mid-semester. Okay, get your redemptions in because um, we want you to, yeah, sort out any errors before the mid-sem and be back on track. So, today um, is... A good part of it is a repeat of last week in bits, okay? We're not actually going and restarting. It's just last week talked about gradient and y-intercept a lot. We said y equals a plus bx a lot. Uh, this week, we just start talking about that. It's just, it's not just y and x this week, okay? A bit of applied stuff. But it's the same exact concept. So if we can relate last week to this week, gold. So... We're still going to use y equals a plus bx, and I'm going to mention the y-intercept and gradient, but the y-intercept I mentioned won't always be for the y-axis. Sometimes the axis will be named p, whatever, any other letter. Let's have a look. There's a graph, a linear graph. This week, I don't care about the negative side on the x's. I don't care about always about the negative side down here. Sometimes. It depends what we're discussing. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, that's um, taxi cost versus distance. Okay, the y-axis is called C, because it's about the cost. The x-axis is called D, because it's about the distance travelled. And also note, some of these examples will be oversimplified, whether taxi is charged by time or distance or whatever. They're just simplified examples. Pretend this taxi just charges you per kilometre. Um, but you can see it started at $2.50. So some of these graphs are going to have an initial thing. That's saying... I paid $2.50 for the taxi, and then my cost kept going up for every kilometre I went. Another one, that's maybe profit versus number of items sold. The profit starts at minus 200. Okay, that's saying if we don't make any items, we're going to lose $200 per day, per whatever. Again, fairly simplified. But there's a certain number of items at which suddenly my profit is nothing, so at least I'm breaking even, and then beyond that, I'm making a profit. So we'll get some common sense into these. First of the gradient. We'll look at the y-intercept in a sec. But the gradient's going to mean more than it did last week. Last week we just said gradient is a half, gradient's two, whatever. Um, we'll still do that, like numerically. This gradient, it's still rise over run. And it's still just making a triangle under the line. But notice it's not the scale. Like it's very much not the scale. Last week I would have looked at that and said I hope the gradient's around the number one. This week, well look, the x-axis has gone 3 while the y-axis is 270. So it's way not to scale, but exactly the same thing happens, as in 
I'm looking at this triangle here. Ver I can see it's a positive gradient. Vertically, I've gone from 0 to 270. Horizontally, I've gone from 0 to 3. So I'm saying my gradient is 270 over 3. That is a 90. So numerically, that gradient is 90. But we could want to know, what does that mean? Let's just look at the units. It's rise over run. The vertical units were kilometres and the horizontal units were hours. So really, I could have said the gradient was 90 kilometres per hour. And hopefully that's telling us, what did it mean? Speed. Okay? We know just from the car that kilometres per hour means the speed I'm going. So the gradient of that graph actually tells you how fast the thing was going. So the gradient's going to mean something. And how are we ever going to know just by looking at the units? Kilometres per hour should spell speed to us. Um, another one. If I just look numerically, I've got 400 over 50. Of course, we can do the calculators, but I can lose a zero from top and bottom. How many fives in 40? There's eight. So my gradient is eight, but what does it mean? Well, the units were dollars over item. Literally it's saying eight dollars per item. So whatever this thing was, was saying, when I bought 50 items, it cost me 400. It was eight dollars per item. Okay, one would be at eight, two would be at 16, three would be at 24, and so on. So it still tells me that was the cost per item. 450 things are 400 dollars. So, Y-intercept and gradient. Here's a Y-intercept example. If that's a bobcat higher cost, which of those seems right? That the Y-intercept, I know it's really a C-intercept on this, but I'm still going to say Y-intercept, because we know Y is vertical. The Y-intercept here is 25, and it's in dollars. What is that $25 telling me out of those options? It's definitely not the time of higher, it's on the c-axis. It's something in dollars. You could think they all sort of make sense, but the y-intercept, you can see it's just the initial cost. It's saying when the time hired is naught, when time is naught, I'm starting here. If I started at naught, the initial cost is naught. But sometimes they'll just charge me, it's going to cost this initially, and then this amount per hour you have it away from us. So the initial cost, the initial value, it's just the y-intercept. A good justification for calling it A, okay? Just think that A value from last week, that Y intercept is where this price starts from. It starts at A, okay? What about the gradient of that graph? Uh, it's not the initial cost. The initial cost is $25. But if I looked at the gradient, well, the meaning of it is just dollars over hours. So dollars per hour, remember over just means per, dollars per hour, definitely B, the cost per hour. The units answered it for me. Dollars over hours is cost per hour. All right, so the units always answer it for you. And the actual gradient there, the main trap here is grabbing, say, I grabbed that point and said, well, it's gone 150 over 10 is 15. What have I done wrong? Is that triangle going through naught? No. Look at the triangle. If I choose a big triangle here to look at, horizontally I've gone from 0 to 10. I agree that's 10, but vertically I haven't gone 150 because I only started at 25. So I've only gone 125, yep. So the gradient of that line is 125 on 10. One decimal back, it's 12 and a half. I didn't have to choose a big triangle. I often will because it's more accurate. Sometimes it's hard to tell where these things go through as in, but you can see this one, that goes through nicely. They're all, they're all doing fine. So if I even just picked a little triangle, I just would have said vertically I've gone 25 or a horizontal of two. Still 12 and a half. Okay, it doesn't matter how big the triangle is I draw. I can still work it out just by drawing a triangle. Just watch for that mistake answer there of just grabbing that number and putting it over that number. That's only if it started from naught. If it didn't start from naught, then I've got to draw a new triangle. Uh, so what formula? Now remember last week we said y equals a plus bx and we're still the same, but what's this y-axis, what's the y being replaced by? What letter? C. So let's get rid of b. It could be tempting because that 
the answer B looks pretty good. We said a gradient of 12 and a half and a Y intercept of 25. So B looks good, but I've just got the letters round. No, it's a C axis. The Y intercept, or and the X axis is a T. The Y intercept is a 25. Positive gradient, and we said the gradient was 12 and a half. I went up 25 over 2. So there it is. Y intercept to 12, 25, uh, gradient of 12 and a half. The gradient's always this th thing multiplying the x. Sure, it's a t here, but the y-intercept stands by itself. The gradient times by the other letter. There it is. Already, if that made sense, I reckon that's probably well, at least a third of this topic. Just knowing what letters to go where, where to put the y-intercept, where to put the gradient. Uh, here's another thing, a thing o higher cost. Um, the rate per hour for that. It's not asking about an initial cost. The initial cost has nothing to do with the rate per hour. They might charge me nothing, they might charge me 200 bucks to get it. But the rate per hour is just, okay, every hour I've taken away, how much extra will you charge me? It's purely the gradient. What's that gradient? C, I would consider the trap answer. Six bucks, grabbing the 120 and putting it over a 20 and getting a six. What should I really be, over 20, how far has it gone up really? Only 100, okay? Because there's my triangle. Same thing as before. I've gone from 20 to 120. It's gone 100 for 20 across. So in other words, 100 on 20, let's use the units just to confirm. It's $100 on 20 hours. 100 on 20 is five, so it's $5 per hour. That's telling me the hourly rate, five bucks per hour. You'll charge me $20 for the looks of things, plus $5 per hour. So B. All right, so we can work out a gradient and read our units. Here's another one. And we're just doing linear stuff. Just want to see what sort of info we can get. It's the sum bucket, the amount of water in a bucket versus time. Clearly, it's a linear relationship. I'm not saying it will be that way necessarily in a bucket. Chances are it won't be. A full bucket will lose water out of a hole quicker than a near empty because there's more pushing it. But we're just simplifying. Uh, how much water was in this bucket at the start? Right there. 1,200 mils. So there's some info I can get. There was 1,200 mils in the bucket when we started this, I call it experiment. You say it's a pretty lousy experiment, but it's an experiment. We started the timer at naught and said, what's happening? Clearly it lost water. How much water was it losing per minute? In other words, I can see it's going downhill. It's got a negative gradient. It's losing water. If I just said to myself, well, A equals 1,200 mils. That was my initial volume. My gradient, well, if I just wanted to draw a triangle here, I, it's hard to read that. Is that exactly between there and there? Look for any points where you see where it's crossed over. You've got the cross hairs there. They're easy to read. Don't try and read in between them. It just makes life harder. I'll just make a triangle. Look, here we'll do. I know the gradient's negative. Vertically, it's gone 200, as in it's gone down 200 for a cross, and it's easy to call that across two. Doesn't matter where we've drawn the boxes. We've got to read the axes more this week because the box might be worth more than one. In this case, each box is worth five. So it's actually 200 over 10 in the negative. So it's a minus 20, and the units is vertical and horizontal, mils per minute. That's exactly what I was just checking. Minus 20 mils per minute means it's just going down at 20 mils per minute. All right, so I knew how much volume was in the bucket. I know at what rate it's leaving the bucket. Any other useful, or any other question you reckon might get asked about this that's off the graph? Sorry? Figure out the formula. Exactly. So what's the formula that's going to predict the amount of water in the bucket? And it's always going to be in the y equals uh, a plus bx form. But again, the y-axis is a v. The x-axis is a t. The initial value here was 1,200. And the b I'm replacing with a minus 20. The gradient was minus 20. I can write plus minus 20 if you want, but plus minus means minus. Remember last week, 
That's what he would have done last week if I had a gradient of minus 20 and a y intercept of 1200. So there's our formula. And how, just say I ask, got asked the question, when will the bucket, assuming it continues to go down like that, when will the bucket be empty? How could I use any of this info to work it out, short of drawing it and just seeing? V equals zero. That's exactly what we're saying. If you look at the formula, I can sub in any times and try and work out when V is zero. Or I could be smart about it and say, if you're asking me when the bucket's empty, all you're saying is, when will V be zero? The volume of water in the bucket. Which is the same as saying, when will it hit? V equals zero. Well, if I let zero equals 1200 minus 20 T, that's when, I know this happens a bit, we say there's not a lot of algebra in this half of the course, but we constantly get this stuff. The old add to both sides, subtract, times or divide. Uh, in this case, I could take 1200 off both sides, but I don't really want minuses. I'm looking at minus 20 T and thinking, let's add 20 T. Okay, if your gut instinct was to take the 1200 across and end up with minuses on each side, that's fine. If you've got a minus on both sides, they can just turn plus. That's all good. But I'd rather add 20t to both sides because now I've got a 20t on the left equals a 1200 on the right. Don't subtract that, 12, that 20. Remember that 20 is times of the t, so we better divide by 20. Divide both sides by 20 and I get my answer of 1200 on 20. Let's lose a zero. 120 divided by 2 is 60. And I'm finding myself at t, and t's in minutes. So it's saying 60 minutes, and this thing would be empty if I do a really rough. I believe that. Around 60, that sounds about right to me. Okay. So that's what we'll use these for. We'll use them. We'll want a y-intercept at times. We'll want maybe that x-intercept because that meant something to us. But again, if that's making sense. We can make formulas and we can sub stuff in. Uh, this one's already in the book. We can find the following information from this linear function. Well, I can say the c-intercept, yes, the y-intercept, let's keep it simple, is the initial fare. So this, got, I got charged $2.50, and then I got charged per kilometre. So the y-intercept tells me the initial fare of $2.50. The gradient, well, let's draw a thing and make sure we get the actual gradient. The rise, it's a right angle triangle, you don't have to do that. The rise over run, well you can see the rise is $21 minus $2.50. That's just the height of that. So 21 minus 250 gets me back to an 1850 rise over a run from 0 to 5. So it's an 1850, $3.70 per kilometre. Um, when you're doing these, you don't have to conclude the units in there. If you just want to put the numbers in and call it 3.7, as long as if it's asking, what's the gradient mean? Dollars per kilometre. That on that. So, he's charging me $2.50 to get in, but $3.70 per kilometre after that. Okay. The equation of the function, just like the last page, I'm thinking, it, well, I've got an A and a B. The A is the wind intercept and the B is the gradient. Those extra zeros there, you don't have to do it. It's just when using dollars and cents, it's pretty natural to write 2.50 instead of 2.5. But it doesn't matter. The y-axis variable is really a c, and the x-axis variable is a d. So there's my answer. Instead of y equals a plus bx, my y was a c, my x was a d, my a was 250, and my b was positive 370. So the formula, if last week made sense, the formula comes out nicely. And uh, I could then get asked, well, what's it going to cost me for a you know, 20 kilometre trip or whatever? Or if I've got $50, how far could I travel? Those are two questions I could get. Like I could then say, well, replace the C with a 50 and solve it to find the T. How far can I get? Okay, either way. Another applied example out of the book incredibly simplistic, um, but a criminologist studying crime in a city found that the number of crimes committed per week, C, so C is crimes per week, great, decreased as the number of police patrol in the city increased. So we've got a one up, one down thing, an inverse type thing. Uh, 
And it's linear inverse, not like inverse we talked about, which was that curve a few weeks ago. It just means one up, one down. So that makes sense, I suppose. Number of police on the beat go up, the crimes per week go down. Determine equation for relationship between C and P, number of police patrolling. Explain the meaning of the y-intercept and the gradient. Now, this is similar to a problem from last week I'll look at in a sec. Because we don't know what the A is and we don't know what the B is. It wasn't given to us in the question. I could estimate it. I could say, well, the A looks halfway in between here and here. But unless it's actually on the, unless it's actually on here, we can't just hope that it's accurate. So let's use these values, these accurate values of that, that and that, to find a gradient and a y-intercept. It's like this question last week. Now we got given two points. We didn't get given a y-intercept or a gradient, yet we could work everything out. Oops. Gradient-wise, we said, well, I've got two points. I could draw a triangle or use that formula. That b equals y2 minus y on an x2 minus x1. If I use the gradient formula, it's just the difference in the y's divided by the difference in the x's. I remember that's an xy and that's an xy. You can be ones and you can be twos. So the y2 minus y1 is the 8 minus 4. The x2 minus x1 is a 10 minus 2. 8 minus 4 is 4 and 10 minus 2 is 8. So there's me finding the gradient using the formula. You can still use that. Or I could have just drawn a triangle and worked out that's a 2, that's a 10, that's a 4, that's an 8. A little sketch would have shown me a side of 4 and a side of 8, and I could have got there. Your call. As for the winder set, when we weren't given it, remember there was a method uh, where we said, look, we know y equals a plus bx, and you've found the gradient. And you don't know the winder set, but you do know other stuff. You know a point it goes through you can sub that into the x and y. Because if I can sub in a b and an x and a y, I've got to be able to find my a. Uh, which point should I use? doesn't matter which of those points I use. It's going to work. I'll just choose the smaller point. In other words, x equals 2, comma y equals 4. All I've done is grab that point there and said, I know that on this line when x is 2, y is a 4, so let's sub them in. Replace the y with a 4. The a is, I don't know yet, plus the b is a gradient of a half times the x is a 2. So there's me chucking everything in. 4 equals a plus, well, a half of 2 is 1. Take 1 off both sides, that a must be a 3. So I found my a and my b. That's all I need. I'll check to see if my labels or my axes are the same as x and y. In this question, they are. So all I'm going to say is instead of y equals a plus bx, y equals, well, the a is a 3 and the B is a half. So that was last week's content, but let's do exactly the same thing to this week's content, with just bigger numbers and different letters. And I know I'm just checking, I want to make sure I get a negative gradient, because it's definitely going down. A, I don't know. I can estimate it, but no, I want to find it accurately. For all I know, it looks like 3250, but it might, might be 3249. Uh, I don't know. Let's find out. Because what's accurate here? This, this, and this. They're accurate. Let's find the gradient. Just chuck it in the formula. Pick whatever points. I've picked uh, 2,500 minus 3,100. In this example, I've gone for the outside two points. It doesn't matter which ones you pick. But I've said it's this y value minus this y value, or this way around, sorry, over the 250 minus the 50. So I've gone this minus this on this minus this. My gradient is minus 600 on 200, which is minus 3. So that's a gradient of minus 3. Radio. Then I can chuck that back in, knowing that the gradient's minus 3, and say, well, I know y equals a plus bx. Choose any point I want, that point will do. And I'm subbing in a y value of 3,100, an a value of, I don't know, a gradient of minus 3 we already found, times 50 is x. So I've just done exactly the same as before. 3 150s, 3 50s is 150. Get rid of a minus 150 by adding 150 to both sides. 
gives me A is 3, 2, 50. So we've got our A and B, and hence we've got a formula. I replace the Y with the C, replace the X with a P, and it's telling me the crimes per week equals 3, 2, 50 minus 3, P. One thing I said was, tell us what these mean now. What's your y-intercept? A, what does the A mean? 3, 2, 50, what means what? And your gradient, minus 3, what means what? Well, the 3, 2, 50 is where it starts. It's clearly crimes per week. And it starts when P equals 0. In other words, I must be saying, 3, 2, 50 is what these reckons the crimes per week would be if you had no police on the beat. When P equals 0, that was my value. We started with no cops and it was 3, 2, 50 a week. So what do A and B represent? A equals 3, 2, 50 is the number of crimes committed when P was 0. What about the B, minus 3? Well, let's look at our units. If I'm ever in doubt what the gradient means, just look at the units. It's this over that. It's crimes per week over Patrice police patrolling. So minus 3 crimes per week per police patrolling is saying that will drop three crimes per week. Minus three, it goes down three crimes per week per policeman patrolling. So when I had an extra 100 police, it went down 300. When I went down another, it went down another 300. So we can get our practical meanings and see exactly what's happening. Every one police officer took three crimes per week off the street. So here's the sort of uh, question we'll get. You get given the graph, so the profit graph from some company X is shown below, where N is the number of items sold. So we've got a profit in P, and it's dollars, okay? We've got number of items sold, whatever they are. And you can see it's starting at a negative profit. If you make, or if you sell none of these things, you lose money. You can see here that it's saying, if I sell 100 items, I'm breaking even, not loss, not profit. And greater than 100 items, I'm starting to make money. But all we want is find an equation to predict company excess profit and explain the meaning of the y-intercept A and the gradient B. Well, let's just find them first. A is actually, we don't have to work it out. We can see it's exactly going to minus 500. So the value of A is minus 500. Again, you don't have to dump the units in here in the equation. It's just minus 500. But what does it mean? That's how many dollars I lose if I uh, sell nothing. When I sold nothing, I still had to turn the machines on, whatever. I still had a cost. So initially, sell nothing, I make a loss of $500. Um, as for the gradient, well, where does it go through? Beautiful. It goes through all these things nicely. I don't have to pick out the nice ones. It's already nice. That triangle will do. Vertically, it's gone from 1,500 to 2,000. So vertical of 500 over horizontally, 400 to 500 is 100. It's a positive gradient. 500 and 100 is just 5. So my gradient is just 5. That's just the number I wanted. But what does that mean? Look at the units. Dollars over number of items. It's $5 over item. $5 per item. I make $5 per item. Okay, might cost me a dollar to make, but it says what profit do I make? I get an increase of $5 in my profit for every item I do. So, I, so maybe, it, maybe I sell them for six and it cost me one, but I increase $5 per profit per item. Again, we don't go into the whole economics of this, but clearly this graph goes up five over one. For every one item, I go up five. That'll do us. So what's the actual um, equation? Instead of y equals a plus bx, replace the y with a p. The a is a minus 500. The b is a positive 5 gradient. And the x is an n-axis. There it is. This company's profit equals minus 500. That was the starting point, plus 5n. For every n I sell, we're going up 5. Makes sense. Cool. Going in there. Bit. Okay. Another one. Exactly the same with one twist. 
One sly dog twist. What's the sly twist in this one? I want to say my wine is set to 500. Why am I wrong? Looks right, but there's something. My wine is set is where it cuts the y axis, and the y axis happens when n equals naught. This hasn't been drawn down to naught. Where would the y axis really be? 200, 100. It'd be over here. The y intercept isn't 500. It's just drawn that way. So I've been given incomplete. If, if it's been drawn this way, where this is naught for this, and this is naught for this, then that's exactly like everything we've done, and we can just look at where it cuts. But I've got an issue here. Really, the y intercept, well, it's, it's over there somewhere. So. So the moral with this one is, I can still work out the gradient, but I'm going to have to calculate the y-intercept. So let's look at some nice points it passes through. It cuts through there, there. All right, we've got some nice points on there. The gradient's going to be easy enough to find. Let's grab this triangle. The gradient, well, it's positive. Uh, vertically, it's gone up 500 there. Horizontally, from 700 to 900, it's 200. So a 500 on a 200 is the same as 5 on 2. It's just two and a half. 500 divided by 200 is 2.5. All right, I've got myself a gradient. The y intercept, well, I admit we could manually work it out from here because that gradient, it's telling me it's going up two and a half for every one. So for every 100, it's going up 250. I could keep taking some 250s off there. But if you can see that, that's great. I want to stick with the standard method, which is what we've been doing last week and this week. Y equals A plus BX. All right, I want to find A. I need a point. No one's written down a point for me here, but I can find a point. Anywhere on that line's a point. What about that point? That'll do. That point tells me when X equals 500, Y equals 1,000. I can use that point. Okay, so any point that's on that line is fine. So replace the y with a thousand. A is I don't know. B is two and a half times an x of five hundred. So one thousand equals a plus two and a half five hundreds. Well, two five hundreds is a thousand. Half of five hundred is two fifty. Send it with a thousand equals a plus twelve fifty. Subtract twelve fifty from both sides we find out that if I'd actually calculated all the way back to naught, the y intercept is actually a bit under. Yeah, it starts with a loss of 150. You sell no items, I lose 250. Okay, we found the y intercept. So now we've got an a and a b, all I've got to do is write y equals a plus bx and replace everything with the correct letters. The y axis is a p, the a is a minus 250, the B is a 2.5 positive, and the X is an N. So the profit of this company is minus 250 plus 2.5 N. All right, so that was just something to look for. Okay. Um, the last bit of these ones is, well, last week we we looked at point of intersections. I'll admit we didn't bother doing many exercises on it because all it was was drawing two graphs on the one bit of paper. This week it means a bit more. Admittedly it's the same thing, but um, this could be all we care about from an applied problem is just where do these two lines cut? At what point am I breaking even? Am I making zero dollars? To the left I'm losing money, to the right I'm making money, but I might just want to know where do these two lines meet? Well there's an example out of the book. I've got some income, I equals 13 in. Maybe I bring in money of $13 for every item that's sold. So if I sell five items, the income is five lots of 13. Okay, so income is that. But the expenses, well, it might be 2,000 plus three in. So the cost to run my plant per week, whatever it is, might be $2,000 plus, there's, it cost me $3 to make each item. So I sell them for 13, I make them for 3, but it's not just that simple, it's not a clear $10 profit per item.
because I've got to fork out $2,000 in my power, my advertising, my staff, my whatever. Every week costs me $2,000 whether I make stuff or not. So it's not unusual to have two graphs, one going through the origin and one not, but we care where they meet. And if that's income versus expenses, money coming in versus money going out, that's pretty critical. That tells me how many items I have to make just to pay my staff, pay my bills, and uh, make no money, just break even. And in this graph, it's telling me, all right, at about 200 items, I'm going to uh, have income and expenses equal to each other. So given that that is the data, what's the point of intersection? What does it represent? Firstly, it asks for an estimate. Well, an estimate. I reckon the estimate is the point of intersection. Estimate is n equals 200. Estimate means just visually. Just make your best guess of it. n equals 200 and uh, income slash expenses equals, well, if that's 2,000, that's 3,000. And I've got one, two, three, four, five boxes there. We've got to say that I've got a gap of 1,000 there and I've got five boxes, so 1,000 on five, it's going up by 200 per box. So we might have to read graphs like this, just work out what's the difference, divide by the number of boxes, so 200 per box. So it's not 2,000, 2,200, 2,400, 2,600. So my estimate is, at 200 items, my income is $2,600, my expenditure is $2,600, I break even. Now, as for the exact one, well, you'd need a very accurate graph or algebra. Might be a bad memory, but last week and more accurately last semester, we had to solve these things. What if income equaled expenses? What if y equals this and y equals that? And we're trying to find where they crossed. We just said, let this equals that. We said, well, if, I equals, if you want to know when i equals e, just let that equal that. Okay, 13n is equal to 2,000 plus 3n. Okay, so if it asks for an estimate or says graphically, it means graph them. Try and work out the point. If it says exact, that must mean algebra, because algebra will give you the precise uh, answer. My technique on this will be, I've got 13n's there, let's let them sit there. Let's remove the 3n's from both sides. If I take 3n away from both sides, 13n comes down to 10n, and the 3n disappears. And if I divide both sides by 10, well, n equals 200. Well, so the graph was pretty accurate there. n was equal to 200, great, that's what I estimated anyway. So it is true, 200 items. But remember with every simultaneous equation, it's not just find one letter, it's find the other as well. What was the income slash expenses? as in the IE. Well, it doesn't matter. Let's just go for income equals. Income equals 13N. 13 times 200. Yep, that's 2600. If I'd used the other formula, it still would have worked. Expenses equals 2000 plus 3Ns, which is 3 by 200, which is still 2600. So whichever way we went there, the graph was well drawn. And accurately, yep, 200 items and your income and expenses are equal to each other. So there was just an example of, yeah, why it might matter to us to find the intersection of two lines. So let's look at one more. And this is stolen from a mid-semester uh, from you know, whatever year. This sort of puts everything together. This will be a large mark holder. Um, but this just puts all of this together. Can we construct an equation and construct another equation? And then can we find out where they meet? So let's go through it. Patrick's investigating two internet plans. Bulk load, and once, yeah, this is way out of date. Let's just go with it. Bulk load has a $10 per month fee and a usage charge of $1.50 per hour. Okay. Well, Speednet has a $50 per month fee and a usage charge of 50 cents per hour. So one only charges 10 bucks, but its hourly rate is pretty high. Speednet charges a, a fair but, mon, amount, 50 bucks, but only charges 50 cents per hour. So there'll be a point at which 
they're equal to each other. Okay? And the aim is let's find it. So if cost, C is cost in dollars and T is time in hours, what are the equations for the cost of each service provider per month? Let's just look at bulk loaf. It's, I mean, it says bulk load, ten dollars per month fee and usage charge of a dollar fifty per hour. So it's ten dollars per month. So let's just cost C is cost in dollars per month. And I could, if I can't think of what the formula is, I just might make up. Say I use five hours. What's it going to cost me? It's going to cost me the ten dollars per month fee plus five lots of the hourly fee. Okay, it's going to cost me the ten dollars. It's the wine set. No matter what I do, I get charged ten bucks. That's the initial fare of hiring the cab, whatever you call it. It costs me ten bucks, whether I use it or not. Plus, it's going to cost me more for every hour, which is tea. It's going to cost me a dollar fifty. Does that make sense? Just look at that and think: Does that formula make sense? My cost equals ten plus one point five times tea. That means if I use no hours, it's one half times naught. One hour, I'll add a dollar fifty to ten. Two hours, I'll add two dollar fifty to ten. That's my formula. Every single one of these questions is going to be exactly the same format. Okay? You may or may not have an initial cost. Some other internet provider might charge two dollars per hour, but no initial cost. So yeah, we could do that. We just wouldn't have a winder set. So it'll be naught. This is that. Speednet. Well, it's only fifty dollars per month. Use your charge of 50 cents per hour. What am I doing wrong? Yeah. That might look okay, but we were talking dollars and dollars and dollars. It's not 50 bucks per hour. I just made it look like 50 bucks per hour. Small trap, but <laughs> make a huge difference. It's not 50 bucks per hour. It's not 0.5 dollars per hour. If we have decided dollars, that's 1.5, that's 0.5. So just ensure that. So if I've got C equals that and C equals that, I found my two formulas. Next question one would assume is when do the plans cost the same? At how many hours of usage would I not care uh, which plan I'd gotten onto? So algebraically, again, it's like what we did. If it equals this and equals that, just make them equal to each other. And we'll find the T when they're equal. C equals this, C equals that. All right, 10 plus 1.5T equals 50 plus 0.5T. Again, I'll stick with the tactic that wherever I've got more Ts, you can sit there. One half T is on the left, half a T on the right. I'm going to make it move. I'm going to subtract half a T from both sides. So on the left, I had one half T, take off half a T, it's a single T. The 10 is still there. One T if you prefer, whatever you, whether I write T or one T. But I just took half a T off the one half T to give one T. On the right, I had a 50, I had half a T minus half a T, it's gone. Um, I don't want that 10 there, so I'll subtract 10 off both sides. Gives me 1t, or rather right, t equals 40. And we've found it already, because that all it asked for, after how many hours? We knew that t was in hours. If it said, and what will the charge be? I could sub 40 hours back into that. It didn't ask it, but let's just check. After 40 hours, the cost with bulk load will be 10 plus 1 and a half 40s. 1 and a half 40s are 60. 10 plus 60, that would be 70 bucks. If I use Speednet, my cost would be 50 plus a half of 40, which is 20. 50 plus 20, which is 70. Point proven. Whichever plan I'm using, 40 hours will cost me $70. Right here. But all this asks for at what usage hours? 40 hours. So there's the algebraically. The exact same question, if you've got asked to do it graphically, you can imagine, I don't want you doing boxes with like 10 values and doing dot, dot, dot and taking up all your time with this. If this were a question and test, we'd give you that grid, we'd give it to you numbered, because we only spend enough time doing these to say, let's work out how to nicely space it and all that. Consider that's a page out of a mid-semester. Can we do it? Well, 
these boxes may or may not be there. All I'm saying is if you can get the starting point and the finishing point, join the dots. Quickest way to do these things, instead of the dot here, dot here, dot here. You know they're straight lines, that's all we're doing. So, if I wanted to know when t equals naught, what's the y-intercept of this thing? Well, it's 10. Clearly when t equals naught, the y-intercept of this line is 10, right there. But this thing just says, well, what if the, where's, where's the cost if it was 60 hours? When t equals 60, well, 10 plus 1 half 60s, 1 and a half times 60 would be 90, 10 plus 90 is 100. So that's saying it'll cost me $100. So the bulk load plan is $10 for naught time, and it's $100 for uh, 60 hours. Okay, so I just plotted two points and I've done my line. It started at 10 bucks, it finished at 100 bucks. Yep. And I know if we're going to ask to do one of these, clearly they're going to cross somewhere nicely. If I draw my other line and it's here, think, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, as soon as we start doing it, you'll see, well, what's the wind up to this one? It starts at 50. All right. I definitely expect the gradient to be less. Well, that's true because the bulk load plan's gradient was one and a half. That green line is one and a half gradient. This one's only going to have a half gradient. It's going to be a third as steep. So it's down here, but it's going to be flatter. Let's check the end point. If I sub in t equals 60, 50 plus half of 60 is 50 plus uh, 30, which is 80. So my opening, my starting point here is a 50. My last point is at 80. Yeah, that's the sort of question we'll have. They cross over somewhere. One had a bigger y intercept, but a smaller gradient. The other, smaller y intercept, bigger gradient. They cut somewhere. And we say, well, we saw it on the last page anyway. If we do this graphically, it says, when t equals 40 hours, the plans are the same. And if we cared, what does each plan cost? 70 bucks. That's what we said on the last page. So algebraically, we can do them. Graphically, we can do them on provided stuff. Uh, yeah, that's our, I'll just check. Both plans cost $70 if used for 40 per month. And that's it for the first half. Okay, have a two minute break. One or two screens, what's better? One? Anyone for two or just go back to one? Ooh, okay. Hang on. Hands up for me to change it now to one screen. Oh yeah, hands up for leave it at two screen. Oh, the twos have it. No offence to any one screeners, I'm not anti. Um, Um, there's Flynn here. No Flynn. No. Yep. Sorry. Yeah, that's better. That's coming. download as well. Sorry.
So if you had one, yes, skip that. 2x plus y equals 0. First thing I'd want to say, well, what is y equals 0? If I want to get rid of that 2x, I better minus 2x. And you're right, but that one, if you had a skip that, it's got a 1 that the north. There's no plus 7 or something, but there's no one to So it cuts to here. The only other thing you need to skip to is that a plus or minus value. And so the other thing is the only Yeah. Yes, yes. I didn't say any of yours. Nope. Nope. As long as you show you that you're going to be plus more. And it's and negative. Yeah. When anything goes to plus more, that just means it's going to be plus more. Yep. Absolutely. And that's it. So, so if you had the sketch y equals 10x, you'd say, well, it's only a sketch. It's not that. It's got a mindset of more. It's got a positive gradient. Just that. But if it was sketch y equals 5 minus 10x, okay, you have the one section. And this is where I get stuck. Okay, and it has got a negative gradient, so this is not a sketch, but I know it's, it's going down like that. But I can way out of scale. My sketch isn't complete until I enter what that number is. But the, the quick, nice way, that's an X in the set. You're always fine when Y equals zero. Yeah. So at that point, Y is not positive, Y is not negative, Y is zero right there. So we have the formula, Y equals 5 minus 10X, and I'm trying to say that Y equals zero. That's a place that Y equals zero equals 5 minus 10X. How do I get rid of a minus 10X?
No. Yeah. Is that why it makes sense? It's like that in the lab and move them as you wish. Whenever the rest X is at stake, and then you subtract the other X. Okay. Yep. It's going to work every time. Good. Understand what you're asking now is the exact question. I think it's a really good quiz for understanding. I think people will get high marks. A lot of people get high levels. It's a good one for this year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Cool. Thank you. Okay, um, it's about to direct you to something and it wasn't there. Submit. Okay, what we're about to look at now is correlation and regression. And okay, you'll see in the book, so we're about to, or soon, we're going to get to some stuff on here, which is talking about how to get some stuff out of the calculator. Probably in a mode you haven't used before, in a stats mode. Um, just note that there's a thing now, there's Canon, all different sorts of calculator types, the Sharps, the $10 Kmart ones that are just called Ditto, or all these different types. So let me know if you've got an odd calculator um, that's not in the book or you can't work out. Ben and I all know how to work it out. Just bring it to the tute and we'll work it out. But these uh, guides that are now in Blackboard, just under course materials, that one PDF, I think, covers every type. Even if it's not named in there, you'll see that it looks similar. Anyway, we'll come back to that at the moment. Let's just go on with the lecture, display, duplicate. Okay. Come on. Next page, please. Okay, lines of best fit. Uh, again, this is not going to be vastly different to what we've been doing. Y equals A plus BX still. The difference in lines of best fit is often, in nearly every case, the dots don't line up like we've been looking at. We've been looking at dots that line up perfectly. And to a formula, that's going to happen. But to real life, of course, if we're doing some actual experiment, we're doing times and readings of something, we're going to have instrument errors, we're going to have human errors, we're going to have timing errors, rounding errors, all sorts of things are going to happen. 
that that will happen. More likely, we get experiments. I mean, that's a good experiment. Sometimes we get experiments which show that, well, nothing. Uh, sometimes we get experiments show a curve. We're only going to do the linear ones, okay? So we're going to look at what if we have some data points from an experiment and we want to know what's the line of best fit for it, as in stick a line through it that we can make an equation for and predict stuff. Okay. Here's an example. So the following data was obtained for the height of a tree versus time since it was planted. So it was in years. So initially, you can see at time equals naught years, it was 0.3 of a metre high. After two years, it was 2.3, 4.9, so on. Now if we plotted them, here's a time of naught giving a height of 0.3. Here's a time of 2, that's at a height of 2.3. 5 gave a height of almost 5. 7 up at 6.3 and 9 at 7.6. And we're going to assume that trees grow in a linear relationship, okay? So if I wanted to try and find a straight line that goes to all of them, that's pretty good. That's me just doing it by eye, okay? I've just gotten, a, let's say, a clear ruler and try to work out roughly a line that looks like it goes as close to all of them as possible. Uh, we're not actually going to do it that way. This is just an intro. We're going to use the calculator to tell us what is the line of best fit. But initially, this is just getting the concept. Hope you'll agree that red line looks pretty good for this data. So if I wanted to find an equation from that red line, I'd want two things. I'd want a y-intercept and a gradient. Give me a y-intercept and a gradient, and I'll make you an equation. The y-intercept here, what I've done here is I've looked for any points that are nice, like the cuts through, that I can accurately read. And if we were doing something like this in an exam, we all might get different answers. That's okay, we're all going to be out a bit. Someone might read that as 7 point no, or 9 going with 7.9. Fine, we're all going to be a little bit different. But I'm just saying that that point looks pretty good going through there. That point looks pretty good. So if I use those two points and create a little triangle under them, I'm going to say my... Firstly, that my y-intercept is roughly, that means approximately equal to, curly equals approximately equal to, that'll do, about 0.5, you might say 0.6. The gradient, here I've said, well, horizontally I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, difference between 8 and 2, so 6. The difference here between 2 and 7. So that's why I've said my gradient is about 5 over 6 or about 0.83 if we use fractions, use decimals, whatever. My y equals a plus bx, but my y is an h and my x is a t. So there's me forming a rough formula from that picture. And I've said that h, in other words, y is approximately equal to the y-intercept plus a gradient of 0.83 times t. So that's telling me that the tree is growing. It starts off around about 0.5 metres and it'll grow about 0.83 metres per year, okay? I mean, the tree was actually 0.3 at the start, but it's an approximation. I know this probably feels a bit weird for maths, but, yeah, it's the line of best fit through these points. So, like I said, there was an intro. What are we going to do? We're going to use the calculator to tell us the best line of fit. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be the best line that can be drawn through these points. So, we're going to use two common methods to describe the relationship between x and y, height and time, whatever it is. First is least squares regression, and that's the calculator is going to calculate the best sort of line that goes through the dots or near the dots. The second thing we're going to say is something that tells us, well, how close was the line to the dots? Now, the wording is going to sound a bit horrid, but pretty soon uh, we'll break that down. It's not. It really isn't. But first, least squares regression. We're just going to call it regression analysis. The calculator is probably going to have a little REG when we go into regression mode. Depends on your calc. But what is it, firstly? Say that was my data. Okay? I had one, two, three, four. There's six points. I'm measuring whatever. When X was this, Y was that. When X was this, Y was that. I got all of these, and I want to put some lines through it. But I don't want to just guess it. I want it to be the best line possible. Now, if I want the best line possible, I'm going to measure all the distances between the points and the line, where that line could move, but you see that? They're all the distances, and I'll label them. Distance A, B, C, D, E, F. 
if I then work out, keep moving that green line, say I make a computer program that moves that green line until the sum of the squares of all those readings is equal to the smallest number possible, I will have found the best line. That, why are they squared? Because some of the differences will be plus and some will be minus. The only reason it gets squared is to make them all pluses. And then if I'm just trying to make them the minimum possible, again, the calculator's doing this for us. It really doesn't matter. But why do we call it least squares regression? Because that's how it's calculated. The best line that fits to give you the square of all those distances equally in the smallest number possible. Just background to it. I thought it was interesting when first reading this. It seemed to be saying something really so incredibly obvious and stupid, but it wasn't. And then it hurt my brain a bit. Francis Golden, so he came up with the term regression. And he's looking at hereditary laws, as in what's, what height son came from what height father. He observed that the physical characteristics of sons were correlated with those of their fathers, as in they related to each other. And this is the thing I thought was monumentally stupid. He found that tall fathers tend to have tall sons, whereas short fathers tend to have short sons. Groundbreaking. But it was the next paragraph that went, OK, this is what he was actually on about. Tall fathers had sons shorter than themselves, and short fathers had sons taller than themselves. So he's saying tall fathers had tall sons that were just a bit shorter than the dad themselves. And short fathers had short sons, but the sons were often taller than themselves which again, just hurt the brain. So you're saying they're short, but they're taller. Okay, okay. His mate got all these dots. That's, every dot there is a father-son pairing. Uh, so this dot here was a, it's olden days, so it's in inches, about a 65-inch father. <laughs> Sounds horrendous. Had a 60-something-inch um, son. Okay, fine. So every one of them is a dot, and there's 1,078 dots. Now, if I was to just draw a red line, that's it. my line, not his line. If they were equal heights, if a 58-inch father had a 58-inch son, and 78 had 78, they'd all lie on this red line. But they don't. And actually, what really happens, can you see the dots are actually a little bit more above that line than not? The actual regression, that least squares thing, if a computer put a line of best fit through these, that's the actual line of best fit. And what that's saying to us is that a 58-inch father would have about a 64-inch son, but a 78-inch father would have about a 74-inch son. So the tall fathers still had tall sons, but they were shorter than themselves. And then I thought, well, that makes sense, because if tall fathers had taller sons and short fathers had shorter sons, we're going to be midgets and giants. Not long, because if everyone just kept, you know, getting taller and shorter, then yeah, it's, it's well, yeah, it's going to be interesting. So it made sense that extreme people on the range would still have tall sons, but they're not continually getting taller. So it was termed regression to mediocrity, as in we might have extremes, but when you're, when you're that tall, you'll have shorter, when you're that short, you'll have taller. Regression to mediocrity. And we all end up roughly the same height. We don't have massive extremes. Um, I think in general, humans are getting a bit taller, but I don't know what that's about. That's not my area. So that was the background. Why is it called a regression? Because we regress to mediocrity, to around a similar height. Now, within that, we're back to stuff that just two terms that we're going to use, and then not to put you off. OK? A question might ask, um, to interpolate some data. Well, all it means is the word interpolate will be used when you're getting asked a question that's within the data. Like in this case, if I ask you about what do you reckon the height of a tree will be after five years or after four years, and you're saying, I reckon about four metres, that's interpolation. And that can be pretty accurate, because I reckon between these dots I can rely six years I reckon I'll get a tree of the same species, about five and a half metres. Interpolation. But if you're asked to extrapolate, extrapolate data from this, uh, it's less reliable because I might be saying, well, so a nine-year-old tree is that tall. What about a 19-year-old tree? So as soon as I come out here, and I'm assuming that it keeps going straight, oh, I'm pushing my luck. You still might get asked it, but 
maybe trees don't keep growing at a linear rate. Maybe a 100-year tree isn't 100 metres tall, so on. So interpolation is asking questions within. Extrapola ex <laughs> extrapolation is just outside the known data. So example here, just that eucalyptus seedling was planted. We did that. Um, and we got a line of best fit worked out by a computer. And that computer, well, the same as a calculator. This is what we're going to ask the calculator to do. Input all those points and then say to it, fit a straight line to it. And all it's going to spit out is an A and a B. Hence why we chose A and B. So if we put all these dots into the calculator and then say, give me an A and a B, this, for these actual numbers, it spit out an A and a B. Now, we might get asked, what do they mean? Well, we know in this example, A is a y-intercept. So the y's are this h-axis. So that's saying these trees start at about a 29 centimetre height. Okay? So this line of best fit had a y-intercept at 29, or 29.18 to be more accurate. Okay, we're just saying that's the initial height of these plants, about 29.18 centimetres. What did the 1.03 mean? Well, it's our gradient. The units of our gradient is centimetres over days. So this is saying that this seedling was growing at about 1.03 centimetres per day, about a centimetre per day. So same as earlier, we can make sense of this output of A and B. The other thing I can do with it is just sub it into y equals a plus bx. The line of best fit must be not y's, they're h's. a is 29.18, b is 1.03, and the x is a t-axis. So if we can get the calculator to spit out an a and a b, we can make an equation. Okay. So, and we'll check it out in a sec. So once we've got an equation, the equation was h equals 29.18 plus 1.03t. If someone asked me about 15 days, that's interpolating. I'm pretty happy. 15 days looks at around the 45 centimetre-ish mark. Let's use the formula. It says 44.63. I don't think we could be quite that accurate about it. But I'd be happy saying after 15 days, you'd expect your seedling to be about 45 centimetres tall. Great. If someone asks me to extrapolate and say, well, what heights are going to be after 200 days? We've got data from 0 to 60, and it's clearly fairly linear. But I can't tell you it's going to still be linear. There's going to be a stage where the growth slows down, when it's an actual tree, not just a ceiling. If I use the equation, it's going to tell me that it's going to be 235.18 centimetres tall after 200 days. And OK, I can do that. but. That's the truth. That's an actual eucalyptus tree height versus time, and you can see it's not linear. So I've already said, we don't go into the non-linear things, and we're just going to get asked to answer it anyway. But just say we got asked a question like that. Um, I think there's one in the cheat sheet that it's something about height of kids, uh, or people under the age of 10, that grow at a fairly, ra uh, fairly linear rate. And then you say, well, what's going to happen when they're 60 and it says something like, well, they're 10 metres tall. Clearly we're not linear growers all the time. We might have growth spurts, linear stage, but then we get old and then sort of start to shrink a bit. So we're not linear. Okay. The first method we said was we're going to get the line of best fit, which was least squares regression, which a calculator is going to do for us. It said there was one other thing we we're going to use, correlation coefficient, which is it's just a little r. Correlation coefficient is just given the letter r. And all this little letter r does is tell us how good was the fit. Like, say I had this data, and it was all almost perfectly on the line. If it was perfectly on the line, that's actually r equals 1. r equals 1 means everything is perfect. You can't get greater than 1. r equals 1. It's like, think of it like a probability. Probability of 1 means, yep, everything's, it must happen. And if all of these were on the line, I'll get an r equals 1. What if uh, they were pretty damn bad? And the computer program put a line of best fit through them like that. But really? Do you want to trust that formula too much? That would have a really low R. 
That might be an R equals 0.1, something like that. So an R equals 0 means there's no visible relationship. An R equals 1 means it's perfect. So let's look at, there's a non-linear one which we're not doing. There's no pattern, that'd be like an R equals 0. There's a linear pattern, that might be R equals say 0.9. So let's look at these things. So we're not using non-linears. So there's garbage. There's no relationship there. A computer would fit a line of best fit, but I wouldn't use it. Okay? So just because you can make a line of best fit doesn't mean to use it. If you make a line of best fit and you've got a good R value, then okay, great, use it. R equals 1. Everything was perfect. The other side of things is if it's got a negative slope, the other end of perfect is minus 1. R equals minus 1 is perfect. It just happens to have a negative gradient. So here's our negative perfect. Here's our positive perfect. And here's halfway in the middle, which is garbage. So that's the scale. Now this is, really we're doing stats here. We haven't called this topic stats, but it is stats. Uh, and that's the scale. Now stats has very got grey areas. Uh, in a previous life as a chemical engineer at the smelter at Curry, um, our standard was 0.7. If you did any experiment and got an R value of 0.7, we'll listen to you. If your R value was less than 0.7, we're not interested in your findings. Um, so, moderate, I've always considered 0.7. Now, we're not going to be such great questions that says, look, you know, you do an experiment and you get this, will you trust your data? We're not a stats course. But we would like to look at these and have some concept. R equals naught. That first one's not telling us anything. Minus 0.7, that's pretty good, but notice it's minus. That's okay. 0.9, that's pretty good. I'd be very happy with that data for an experiment. It's obviously extremely happy with that one. Just note, okay, it goes downhill, negative. 0.5, no, 0.7 is about as low as I'd go to say it's meaningful. This 0.5, I'd say, no, nah, that's, I, no. Make a better experiment. And this one, anything down as low as 0.3 or minus 0.3, that's just as useless as that is, okay? Which of them might be a minus 0.8, an R value of minus 0.8. And this is something we could be expected to answer, like, can you see there's only really, there's two preferable answers. Why would I get rid of A? It's positive. It might be a positive 0.8, but it's not minus 0.8. D, well, you could put a line through it, but there's no way it's up in the 0.8 zone. That's pretty horrid. What I'd hope to see here is B is almost perfect. That's not 0.8. C is the only one that could be... B and C are both negative, absolutely. But B would be like 0.99 or something. B is immaculate data. C is, yeah, it's pretty good. About 0.8. If we look at some others. This is uh, wind farm electricity generation from some um, places in New Zealand. And that's an R of 0 0.006. So they've measured the wind farm electricity generation at Brooklyn and at Gabby's Pass to see if there's any correlation between the two. So there's a lot of data there. And 0.006R says it's garbage. Or no, it doesn't say it's garbage. It says there's no correlation going on between these two places. Okay? There's an R equals 0.27. Like we said, 0.27. You might think, well, that's better than 0.006. It's still garbage. There is no, I'm not going to fit a line through that. But that's pretty awesome. And it might look like, hang on, you've still got lots of dots that are out there, but it's a 0.94. That's fantastic. That's saying there is definitely a correlation between these two. When it's low here, it's low here. When it's high here, it's high here. Definitely. There's some exceptions. Okay? But there's always going to be exceptions in real life data. Now, Another type of correlation, we've just said, if the dots are there, we're saying, you relate to you, like that back one. I was saying, definitely, I can't say his names properly, but Tia Pitti, wind uh, farm generation is low when it's low at Tararua, one and two. Clearly, they're close to each other or fed by the same wind streams. But spurious correlation occurs when high values of the correlation coefficient are attained where there's no direct connection between variables. Like, imagine if I plotted consumption of alcohol versus number of new cars sold. 
and I said, um, when throughout a year, when the alcohol consumption in Newcastle was high, we had a lot of cars getting sold. When in a certain part of the year, when alcohol consumption was low in general around Newcastle, there weren't many cars being sold. Awesome correlation. Does that mean that you drink and you go and buy cars? Well, it could, but could there be a third thing in here? Maybe people can drink more or afford to drink more when times are good and they can afford to buy a car. So that's spurious correlation. You can't, just because you get this awesome R graph and say R is 0.94, therefore proven. No, maybe when financial times are good, people have got disposable income, they can afford cars and extravagances. When things are tight, they can't. It's like the next one. Ice cream sales versus swimming pool drownings. We plotted and found a perfect correlation that when ice cream sales were high, a lot of people were drowning in pools. Hence, ice cream causes drowning. So, you know, you could, you could make these statements, but of course there's a third factor, probably called summer. The hotter it is, unfortunately, the more pool drownings we get and the more ice cream you sell. So, again, we're not a stats course. We give an intro. A lot of you won't be able to avoid it um, throughout uni because no matter what area you go into, they talk stats. It doesn't have to be engineering, any of the health sciences, any, especially um, speech pathology, all that, when you're reading documents about things and they're using stats to justify experiments. Anyway, we just give an intro. So we're not going to be testing for significant correlation. That's something a software package does. But we are going to talk about correlation coefficients. How far do you need to know? What we were looking at, you know, an R of 0.7 is OK. An R of 1 is perfect. R of minus 1 is perfect. That'll do. And the calculator is going to spit out an R value for us for the data we give it. So let's look at that. I'm not going to spend ages on the calculator doing of this because um, we will have some different calculators around the place. And again, I assure you that the instructions you see here for the FX82AU plus or plus 1 or plus 2 um, we've got, um, I've got stuff on Blackboard for your calculator. Which one's been put in the book? Just that one? Yeah, just that one. So I just want to go through an exercise We're in a sec. Um, there's an exercise, and none of our quizzes are going to have that much data to put in, because that's just a time consumer. Okay? But if I put all of that into my calculator, this is just a test for if you want to test it at home. And look at that graph. You can see uh, the R value, it's not, going to be, it's not going to be an awesome R value. What did the calculator spit out? 0.783. So it's saying that's about the bottom level of we'll take any notice of you. But let's look at this one to visualise that. Uh, let me carry it right. Okay. Unfortunately, it's the calculator with very little uh, numbers on it. But okay. And doing it for this one, this is pretty typical. All I've got is four data points. When x was 5, y was 12, x is 6, y is 14. There's only four points. There's the point, four points on here. And what I want to do is ask the calculator, give us an A, give us a B, give us an R. Okay? Um, the correlation coefficient, that's the R value. And the linear regression equation is the y equals A plus BX. In other words, give us my A and the B. I want a little r, a big A, big B, and then I'll tell you the r might be uh, 0.9-ish. The a is, well, something cutting down here. Hopefully a is, just, a is 3 ish And the gradient is, well, just say it's something like that. I'll expect my gradient to be something like 16 on 8, 2 ish Okay? But anyway, let's find out. Uh, I should have known... Okay, that's just normal mode. It's really not good, is it? Okay. Um, if we're going to stat mode, it's mode and then stat. Okay, and then it's got all these variables. Uh, but look at A plus BX. That's exactly what we've been doing. Y equals A plus BX. That's the, st that's the mode I'm going into, mode 2. And then, depending on the calculator setting, um, well, you should have an XY column. You may have a frequency column here. If you do ignore it, 
It can be turned on and off and it makes no difference. But in this mode, it asks me for X's and Y's. Well, my X's are 5, 6, 7, 8, and my Y's are here. So I'll just put them in on this calculator. You've got to press equals after each thing. Equals is like your enter. So 5 equals, 6 equals, 7 equals, 8 equals. I can arrow across and in, but there's my 5, 6, 7, 8 have gone into X. 5 goes with 12. Make sure they're lined up. Equals. 6 goes with 14. 7 goes with 14. Um, 8 goes with 17. Okay, so that's, I've put all my data in. 5, 12, 6, 14, 7, 14, 8, 17. I'll quickly have a look at the other style of calculator too, but with us on the FX82 AUs, that's good because if you make a mistake there, you can still go and delete it and fix it up. Um, now this is going to sound odd. If I go straight into stat mode from here, it's going to get the answer and put into this, into this table of data. In other words, you've got to press all clear. Once you put the data in, you've got to press all clear, which doesn't really all clear. That memory is still there. But if you don't press AC after putting the data in the table, next calculation I do and press equals, it chucks that in the table. It's stupid. Moral of the story, put your data in, press AC. Now the data's in there. It's still telling me I'm in stat mode. I want three things. I want my arm, A, and my B. On this calculator, at least the yellow is legible. Oh, legible? There's a little stat on the number one key. So shift and stat, and then it gives me these options. That was shift one. Type, data, blah, 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 blah. Regression. We're doing regression. Okay? So five. And there's your A, B, and R. The X with the cap on it, the Y with the cap on it, we don't care. But that's, that's all I want from this. If I go, if I press 1 for A equals, A equals 4.5. I'll go back into shift 1, regression, 2 for B equals, B equals 1.5, shift stat, regression, 3 for R, R equals 0.939, blah, 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 blah. Let's just look at what it's told us. A equals 4.5, so it says the actual line of best fit, I wasn't too good with the line I put there, it's four and a half, that's four, that's five. So it starts about there, and its gradient is one and a half. For every one across it goes, it goes up one and a half. For every one across it goes, so, oh God, I, there's a typo. That, sorry about that, I hadn't realised that had slipped. All of those numbers are across a bit. Seven, eight, nine. So if I then build up the gradient and say, well, if it's one and a half times nine, that's nine plus four and a half, that's 13.5 plus 4.5. Uh, but here it ends up about 18. So my rule line of best fit should have been something like, mm, from there to there. Okay, I haven't drawn that well, but there's my line of best fit. And was it a good line of best fit? 0.939 was great. Okay, what from that do we need to do? We didn't have to really graph it. That was just to do on the side. All we are getting asked, find the correlation coefficient, 0.939. We might get asked, is that, what's that telling us? It's telling us it's a great line of best fit. The data is close to it. It goes close or near all the points. The only other thing you want is a linear regression equation. Remember, all we care about is y equals a plus bx. Firstly, I'll check. Are we still talking... Oops, sorry. Are we still talking x and y? Yeah, we're still talking x and y on this picture. So all I've got to do is say uh, y equals a of 4.5 plus 1.5x. That's all we have to do. If we can put our data into a calculator, find an R and an A and a B and form the equation. Y is set to 4.5, gradient 1 and a half. Yeah, that's us. Um, what's probably another common... Has anyone got one of those abacus ones? They seem to be around a bit. No. Uh, sharp. Yeah. Can I nick that for a sec? Yeah. There's still these around. I think they're like the, well, we'll find out. Um, it's quite different on these ones. 
But if we go into mode, and then it says normal mode or stat mode, uh, stat, and then standard deviation, linear or quadratics, we're linear. And then to put numbers into this thing, you put them in pairs. 5, 12 is a point. So I do 5, and then there's a little under the stow key is a little comma. So 5, 12, memory plus. And the instructions are on Blackboard for it, but then 6, 14 plus, 7, 14 plus, and 8, 17 plus. It says my data set is 4 because there's 4 points in it. And then as my A, B, and R, my little green A is there, my little green B is there, they use lowercase on this count, and the little R is right in front of me. Which one? Divide. Oh, it's up. On the divide key. So A, B, R, they're all the things I need. They're in green writing. So I'd go alpha left bracket, A is 4.5, correct? Alpha green bracket is 1.5, and alpha divide. So it's exactly the same. It's actually a bit quicker on these calculators because the keys are right there. So, thanks for that. Oh, and then to get out, just back to well, mode normal on that, or mode comp on these other ones, FX82AU. When we first press the mode button, I wanted comp or stat. Comp is normal computations. One is just go normal. If you've stuffed up your numbers or whatever, when you exit out of stat mode, it deletes the memory. Okay? If I go back in stat mode now, it's clear. So if you're just not sure, just mode one out of it, and then mode two back into stat mode. So there's our uh, fairly brief, but do hassle us in the chute. Ben and I love our calculators. Oh, not that one. HDMI. So there's the the pretty line of best fit. Again, not making you do the line of best fit, just making you, if you can work out y equals four and a half plus one half x, beautiful. And the last example is once again, it's just, we're not getting you to do it. It's all good, look at this example and go, oh really? We're putting in IQ's grade point average. The main thing to note there is, there's 12 students, but those numbers, one to 12, don't go into the cap. The cap just wants x's and y's. So here, it doesn't matter which way I go, I might make the x's here and the y's here. We put them all into the calculator. It gives us the a and the b. We can form an equation. And we can replace the x with the x and the y with the y. And we can then use that equation to answer other questions. So I'm getting rid of that last example. So anyway, again, hassle is in the tube if you don't understand your calculator. Would we ask that in next week's quiz? Absolutely. What I'll do, hmm. what I should have done live, I was thinking that, David, since A was equal to 4.5 and B was equal to 1.5, nice. No, y equals A plus BX, the best way would have been okay, you got a 4.5, but when X is 9, Four and a half times nine. So that'll give you that one.
Okay, we won't do it manually. The only that was just a lead up to show you what I'm going to do is for the cat play that we'll tell you. We'll go to the last question. Here's four points. Can you stick in a cat play? Can you get an A, B, and an R? Yes. And can you hence find the equation? Well, the equation is put an A and B in the A plus BX. And if the R comes out at 0.8, would you be able to select that that's pretty good? Or if the R came out at point three, we'd be able to choose the option that said not good. I'm going to be able to have to graph what we can no. find. So line of best fit is just our equation. It, it is. I mean, it's both. It's the equation and the drawing. Okay. Just worry about the equation. Just plug in the A and the B and the Y is A plus BX. That's all we need. Yeah. Right. Well, that all made sense. So I'm going to good. probably not grade the drawing. Okay. That made sense. All right. That's good to hear.